founding partner of Alton Partners LLP, an architectural urban design and planning firm with a focus on integrated public and private sector projects. Welcome to our commission, and you take as much time as you need. I'm not sure if I just might uh, introduce uh, the, the talk. I'm Don Moby, we built Toronto um, several years ago. As most of you know, we were uh, built Toronto. The council declared the surplus for turnover, the approximately seven of the nine and a half acres controlled by the TTC at the end of the day, uh, subject to identify all of the transit needs and uh, subject to the retention by the TTC as of those needs. We've since been working over the last year and a half on trying to create a concept and working on identifying those needs and become very excited about the potential for this project and about creating a, a fabulous intermodal, multimodal transit hub here. And we reached out to Ronald Altrin uh, a little while ago and he's agreed to come here from Los Angeles and he took the red eye so hopefully he doesn't fall asleep. But uh, we're pleased to have him here too discuss some of the work over the last 20 years that he's done around transit stations and developed in the ground. Thank you. There's a mandate for public transit for the transit of
rather than in a period of time to stay. So what are we really doing? Um, looking at all of this, it all begins essentially with, with transit stations. I'm going to go through three things with you. I'll try to do it really fast. Um, tra transit station designs are really critical to this, but it's important to understand that public transit systems are often viewed as engineering exercises. It's kind of like plumbing for people, um, moving the optimal number of people in the most efficient way, satisfying peak hour demand. But it needs a more synergistic evaluation that includes an economic development and results in addressing higher quality of life uh, issues. Um, years ago, centuries ago, under Napoleon, Baron Hausmann did a plan for Paris, to transform Paris from the medieval town into the city of light. For my city, Measure R is the Hausmann plan. It gives us a chance to redefine our DNA, we deal with that university and livability in a way that we're not known to do. So if it's the connection of an of a engineering system to a lifestyle system, somehow the station itself has to be hospitable. Somehow the station itself has to be destination. So we begin there. It has to be aspirational. It has to have ease of access and egress and navigation, a sense of orientation and order and a sense of place. So I'm going to show you two stations that, that are in Singapore, a place that sees the public infrastructure as essential in terms of driving its economic and social development. You can try to leverage uh, community assets and, and, and public sector assets. So just a quick peek at a couple of transit stations that are highly complex, two means of rail transit, bus and taxis and other things, that create places that you arrive at one of the places that, that stimulate you and you aspire to use and, and to understand that you can arrive at the destination that you want. Um, the second one, a little smaller one, is having housing that you see on the fringes there coming in now and being built directly up against the station so it's a transfer between subway and bus stations. But the inclusion of public art, inclusion of amenities that make the ride pleasant. The transit sector and the private sector have the same needs and desires, the same expectations of each other and of themselves. The issue here is the competency at the municipal level. Within our county, we have 56 cities. The same metro system, the same developer can either achieve high results or no results, depending on the competency within the municipality. So if you're dealing as example of a system that is beyond the city of Toronto, where this engages other cities, as example, your challenges will be different in different places and you need to you can anticipate that. Um, in 2003, the Urban Land Institute created 10 principles for successful development on transit. Make it better with a vision. They call it a BHAG. A BHAG is a big, very audacious goal. Thinking beyond what your expectations are Apply the power of partnerships. In this case, we're talking about public-private partnerships, relationships with the community. Think the development when thinking about transit. It's not just about the transit system. It's about what it engages with and how to make the best out of both. Get the parking way. In this case, reduce parking, but accommodate another one. <coughs> Build a place, not a project. You want to arrive at a, at a nozzle somewhere. You want to arrive at is it is a place that attracts people. Make the retail development market driven, not transit driven. Transit, as good as it is, will not support retail. Retail is supported by the communities that shop at it and competition that challenges it. Retail helps to support it. Transit helps facilitate it. Mix the uses, not necessarily in the same place. And engage buses, make them a great idea. We've done that in three or four different modes. It's actually become very, very popular. Encourage every price point to live around that. Every price point. And encourage corporate participation and attention. Very important thing to do. I'm going to illustrate a few examples to you. Um, a TOD, a transit, a transit oriented development, generally above transit, transit adjacent. I'm not going to talk in about the next stage. But in Nanjing, where we're working right now on five projects, 
to all satisfy these, these goals. We have a client that um, in the Heshi area had the opportunity to build an infill in between the convention center and the Olympic Stadium. Um, all together they build eight and a half million square feet. Uh, there are all kinds of components to this, high rise, mid rise, and low rise office, uh, hospitality and conference centers, residential, public park civic spaces, cultural facilities, on what's today called the Greenfield site. This is the project. Um, it's a rather large project. It's connected, you have a north-south and east-west subway line. The, the exit to the street directly, but also directly by concourse to the heart of this project, from which you connect to all the office buildings, the hotel, the conference center, even up towards the residential district and the city space. This is the arrival place, the hole there is where you arrive coming out of the subway, this space. And it takes you into the heart of the project, and immediately at that same level is the civic space. The space that transforms in the winter with an Olympic sized ice cream, in the summer to concerts and other types of programs. The place of the collection of cultural artifacts, of restaurants, and dining, and a public park, a large public park, as well as the office buildings, a hotel, conference center, things that come around it. It engages as well to a transit adjacent project that has two office buildings and a retail component and some residential. And that's all engaged underground and really complete. So a TOD is an above or immediately contiguous project uh, related to a transit station has direct access to the station and one must not have to cross traffic to get to it. really plugged in. Um, in Hong Kong, we were involved in the Hong Kong's uh, station development, which has direct access from high-speed train from the airport into the city, as well as subways, buses, and taxis. And the whole issue here is that from this spot, you can get anywhere and you provide a place where people gather. There are wedding receptions that are held here public space that's part of this public space, all trying to create amenities there that did not exist in the community and therefore cause transit to become in and part of the life form. Um, here in Toronto, we were engaged as a consultant by the city of Toronto and a private developer to look at what could happen underneath Toronto utilization, which you, which you call the big gap. We provided a retail plan that would do that, but the issue here, again, was not a plumbing issue. It wasn't to move people. It was to take the transit station and make it a nexus. That if you were going to the CN Tower, the Roy Thompson Hall, or the, uh, watch a hockey game, or anything else, this would be the place you might meet. It might be the place you might die. The place that would distribute people coming from different directions. So, Moving past that and all the things we did for that, um, in Moscow, in a curious location right here at the Kremlin, we have a site where you're adjacent to the Kremlin, to Red Square, to the Boom, to the Bolshoi, to the Duma, and in the middle of it, you're in the middle of transit lines going everywhere. And so you work with that to provide destinations that people will come to and go to, and be really connected. In Jinan, back in China, they just completed their high-speed rail line a year ago in July. Uh, Jinan is a city that's 10 kilometers north-south, 90 kilometers east-west, and this is the far west side. And so they're trying to develop a new city. So this large mixed-use project that connects from the high-speed and regional railway is connected by subway, also the buses, or the gateway. So this is a bit premature. The community isn't built around it, but the vision is there. And the idea with all of this is to create a vision, to inspire a high, higher level of development in consolidated spaces so that transit is used effectively. Um, in Moscow, there's a project that is both a TOD and a TAD. It's right next to a station. It's infill within a residential area, but in a way that creates a level of excitement where everything was rather boring before. So you have the opportunity by dealing with transit to energize places that were uh, born before. With office, with 
retail, with leisure, with all kinds of things. So what are the lessons learned from all of this? There's no single, single formula for transit-related development. Most of these developments are a marriage of a public sector mandate, which you're dealing with, private sector vision, and community acceptance. The community is essential. They differ in every community. It's critical for the public sector to understand the risk assumed by the private sector partner and the return of investments required to secure financing. It's actually very complex to build above and adjacent transit. It requires a high degree of leadership on the public sector side and comprehensive environmental analysis. In the U.S. right now, the U.S. General Services Administration, the GSA, which is our largest landlord, has a new urban design policy. All future offices that they occupy or develop will be within walking distance of a transit-oriented development. It will reduce private sector vehicle dependency, it will reduce carbon emissions, increase public transit dependency, stimulate transit-oriented private sector developer development, and increase public-private partnerships. So, in conclusion, the Urban Land Institute more recently created 10 strategies for extracting investment. First is invest in walkability, make the urban scape, the street scape uh, consistent with what's going on in the development itself and the area of its surrounding. Increase transit to create value, concentrate new development in nodes, start with downtown oriented development, pursue the catalytic public projects. At the same time, tackle the issue of parking. Invest according to your ambitions. If you're passionate about something, you'll do even better than if you're not. Create cohesion with existing neighborhoods, get the density right, and educate the public on your needs. The second remarkable thing that I'm going to end with and tell you about is that this measure R is expected to pass. The measure J is expected to pass. Uh, someone talked earlier about being taxed. Let me tell you something, I drive 22 miles to work every day, back and forth, because I don't have a transit line that takes me. When I see the traffic, I'm taxed. I'm taxed by the work efficiency that is completed for me and everyone else that's on that road next to me. That's a tax. It's a tax on my life, it's on my lifestyle, it's on my pocketbook, it's on everything else. When I breathe more polluted air, I'm taxed. I'm physically taxed. So there are many kind of taxes. And the one that, that we decided to favor in Southern California is the tax that actually just helps reduce the other taxes and make life a whole lot better. Um, at this point, if there are any questions that you have, I'll just close with a remark that is, it's, this is moving beyond thinking about the objective. Because the objective always deals with me dealing with a subject which always deals with desire. When you put the two together, you create a lot of people joy. I think that's what it means to have. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, when you discuss measure, measure <coughs> J, the half percent sales tax for another three decades, that was put forward as a proposition of a dedicated tax. It's a dedicated tax that began in 2008 that will be extended. Measure J will not be a new tax. It's a continuation of the existing tax. It's a half percent on sales in Los Angeles County. It is absolutely dedicated to uh, uh, the public transit system. It goes directly to the metro and they disperse it. In your experience, do you think it passed because it was a dedicated tax, or do you, you know if this had been a half percent sales tax proposition, the people just said, well, government is good, and they hire lifeguards, and they run daycare centers, and they have police officers, and health inspectors, and transit, and therefore we would, would support this if it looked everything, all the good things government does, or do you think, in your experience, it was because it was dedicated for a sole and specific purpose? Uh, California has a history of enacting specific uh, funding sources, uh, 
sources that will be dedicated specifically for something, and then the legislature says, good, now you've got that there. We'll take all the money we were giving to it and take it away. So it doesn't that's what happened with our state lottery. This tax was dedicated specifically for use by the by Metro only in Los Angeles County and would not replace any funding that was currently in place. Sorry, you say that would not replace any funding currently in place. All this was kind of like where? Sorry. Uh, Los Angeles County. And, um, I believe it passed for several reasons. Number one, we had about the highest uh, cost of gasoline until this year, which is surpassing. Uh, we had an economy that was turning down more people having to depend on public transit because of the cost of gasoline and not having enough of it there. Uh, it, it was just <coughs> And in your presentation, or is it your advice to us, we're building a number of LRT stations now and subway stations. My members are correct, I don't think any of them have any uh, urban development built on top of them, certainly. And if my memory is correct, probably not really even the side or adjacent to them. Is your submission to us, even though we, you know, might be the train may have left one of our stations or a few of our stations already, but is your submission to us that we as a commission should be looking at building either on top of or adjacent to our stations? Because other than a couple of very high profile examples, we just basically own roads. We don't own the parking lots next door, or the Dairy Queen, or the Dollar Store, or the place where the, the Palm Reader is. Uh, we just own that, that right away. So is it your submission you should be building on top of the stations? Uh, Jason, to them? Every, every situation has its own demand, its own requirement. Generally, every one of these that I show you, it's a relationship between a private sector and a public sector. The private sector is doing the buildings, the public sector is identifying what land is available to build it on, and working together, they are trying to determine what the best um, uh, entitlement for the entitlement would be for that area. In some cases, you have to go back to your zoning situation and amend that to create an increased floor area ratio that is allowable. What I found in Los Angeles is we're under the we're building to the same zoning. We're simply providing transit and encouraging development there. You go to Hong Kong, you go to Nanjing, you go to other places, they're saying these transit locations are once in a lifetime opportunities that deserve higher density there, that deserve lower density everywhere else. You can accommodate growth and the influx of people. It's best to consolidate it and put that where people can use public transit for mobility. And then finally, Madam, through Madam Chair, do you think the technology is there on many of these stations to build over top of them without the liability or the over engineering to make sure that your building or your condo doesn't shake every time a subway goes by or an LRT goes by? Yes, I believe the technology is there. I think people have been doing this around the world for a long time. Uh, uh, I, we do a lot of work uh, in Moscow. We do a lot of work in Europe. I'm always riding trains in transit underground. Uh, I see the same thing in, in uh, Asia. But, uh, I think the technology is there. Thank you. There's a, additional questions. Mr. Park and Mr. Hill. Uh, thanks for your presentation today. Um, half a percent sales tax on top of what other sales tax is already in place in this area? Oh, I wish I could tell you. <laughs> um, I, I believe we're overtaxed in California. We're somewhere around 9%. Uh, just California. Oh, the, the, the sales tax. The sales tax is only applicable in Los Angeles County. So if you live in Orange County, right next door is not taxed. But it's above whatever our, our, our sales tax is incorporated as part of the state tax, state sales tax. So our our ad is just on top of the state sales tax. Okay, that ad takes up about eight and three quarters. So the going the, the standard sales tax rate in Los Angeles, absent this measure, would be eight or around eight and a half percent. Eight and a quarter. Eight and a quarter. Is that half a percent on top of that? 
And how was half a percent arrived at as the right figure to, to aim at? Uh, it, it all came out of uh, evaluation made by the transit agency as to what what they would need and what the annual spend uh, in, in sales revenue was uh, in order to get them forty million dollars that they felt they needed to put this out. Was there any debate around whether it should be less than a half percent, more than half a percent, or was it strictly half a percent yes or no? It was half yes or no. And how much blood was spilled on the floor or back question? Actually not very much. We were all of us were surprised that it passed, and it passed, it is 67% of the past, it got 68 and a half. And many of us thought it would have trouble getting 60. But the will was there. Um, are there any measures in place, or is there confidence that the half percent sales tax will go into a pot and just displace other money that would have come into the pot but will now go somewhere else instead? I, I, I've asked the question of the transit agency, and they have assured me that there are provisions in place that won't allow that to happen. Uh, and, and you opened with a, a quick little fun fact that I didn't quite catch at all. The 1,100 miles of package, when, when, when did you have that? Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, um, the red car was built throughout Southern California. Uh, and it went everywhere. It went down to Long Beach, it went to the Pacific Coliseums, it went everywhere. My father used to ride the red car out to the very end on the west side of Los Angeles in a suit and a rifle and shoot jackrabbits at lunch. It was that kind of thing. Uh, it was removed. You're giving us ideas now. <laughs> <laughs> it was removed, as I said, uh, I think of the, I used to ride the red car downtown with my grandma and street car system. And it was removed when General Motors and Tire Company approached the mayor and said, we'll give you a whole fleet of new buses, but you've got to get rid of those tracks because they're destroying the tires. And they covered the tracks with asphalt, covered the lines, and was it back. Which anticipates the next and last question I had in mind for you. Uh, when, exactly when was that? When did you lose the tracks? In the 50s. In the early 50s. Okay, so it's a figure of who the mayor was. I <laughs> don't work on Google. Yeah, I think I have a little bit. <laughs> okay, thank you. About the city of Nanjing, China, uh, what's the population of this city? Oh, the second tier city, I'm guessing it's in the uh, 8 million range. Uh, this part of the city is about 20 minutes outside of the park. And uh, it's an area that uh, would probably not be developed except for I think their Olympic Stadium there. Uh, the new convention center is there. And now um, at the same intersection there are three buildings, uh, two nearly complete and one going up, that are all in excess of 60 stories. And uh, out of our 8 million, uh, what's the percentage of people who are driving their own cars? It's, it's, it's really low. Um, I can tell you with this project, we provided parking for 7,000 bicycles. And uh, I read somewhere that the Canadian government that we own uh, most of cars for Uh Now, coming back to 10th fiscal number two, a final power of partnership for 10th fiscal in your business second one. So, can you tell us uh, the uh, actual scenario or case? Uh, what do you mean by the applied power partnership? Who are the partners? What percentage? And then to build this Boston uh, Central AD? I'd like to learn some more. Yeah. Uh, the public sector built out the subway system in its entirety, the road system in its entirety, and the bus system. The public sector. The public sector. It's not the public sector. Um, public sector. And they built a uh, very rich uh, landscape program that goes along with that. The, they also build a public park across the street. The private sector is doing the entire development and not being charged back for any percentage of the public sector improvements. So it means that the private sector, not burdened with adding more lanes to a to a road or improving traffic, signalization, or anything such as that. None of that burden. 
they're then able to spend their money on creating a, a, a richer development. Part of the project includes a, a park in the middle of it that would be owned by the city. And the negotiation was made with the city to remove the, the to excavate under what would be the park. So the developer could build two levels of parking and a sunken public space and the park above the rest of it. So they would be providing a public amenity at their expense, but then in exchange for being able to build underneath it, which would make more efficient parking. So uh, you said that the uh, investment for the transit by the public sector and municipal sector get more detailed information about percentage from federal government, about percentage of municipal Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have that information. I, I imagine that this is mostly locally generated. And uh, it works well. Well, anyway. Yeah, it works very well. well. It's, I, I arrived there by high-speed train from Shanghai, and 20 minutes I'm at my site by one, one subway without going outside. Thank you.